one, two, cambio, cambio, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two, swam, two, three, one. One, two. <coughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. When I was uh, very much younger, I saw Spalding Gray sit behind a table and just tell stories. And that was a fantastic thing. And I thought, oh, yeah. uh, maybe one day I'll try and make a show like that. He climbed into his hammock feeling particularly alone because he was in the middle of a busy human community, unable to communicate. And then it's a kind of painstaking process. I mean, I make it in the same way as I make any show. I, I, I build it up in bits. I have a little fragment here and a fragment there. And then, you know, I go to the next bit and the next bit. and. I try to tell the story and then I try to stage the story. and So it's a process of uh, deconstructing and reconstructing and, and uh, trying and failing. This good, 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 good morning. Ah, oh, good morning, Mrs. Applebaum. Come on in, I'm on the phone with Con Ed. Oi, Con Ed, no, 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 I just wanna see my little girl. Little? She's 15, yes, 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 I'm still here. Okay, there's a lot of preparation when you do solo pieces because not only do you have to prepare like a regular actor prepares, um, vocally and um, physically, but you also have to prepare emotionally. You are the only one on that stage, and in a way, the energy of the audience is directed towards you. So you have to be grounded enough to be able to accept that energy and reflect it back to them. Doing a solo piece is really daunting. I'm, I'm a person who likes to work in a team, and I happen to have a really great team on this. But when I'm up there, I'm up there by myself, and there's no place else to go. But I do rely on the audience. The audience becomes the other character in the, in the, in the piece for me. And so whatever I'm getting from the audience, I'm able to take and incorporate and, and find a way to take it in and give it back and then and give back to them. So there's this constant exchange of energy. But to have nobody else up there, it's really, it's, it's frightening. There's no, there's no net. The way that I tell the story is with microphones so that I can get a more intimate and closer relationship with the audience. And to take that even a step further, I ask every member of the audience to wear a set of headphones. Is you say, well, why, why, why are we wearing headphones? We're coming into a theater. We all want to get, be together. We want to uh, hear each other. Well, the piece is partly about what happens inside your head, as well as inside the head of Lauren McIntyre. In other words, it is about solitude. It's also about somebody who feels cut off. And I was trying to think, how can we make people feel cut off from one from another, even though they're in a big audience? And there, the headphones are extraordinary because everybody in the audience feels that they're having their own individual relationship with the piece. Advertising's main functions are to inform, persuade, and inform. I also use a microphone, which is called a binaural head. It's, you have a pair of headphones and you're listening to this head. It can seem as though you are literally uh, there in the position of the head. It has been called three-dimensional hearing. I can whisper something and it can feel as if I'm very, very close to you. Uh, and so you get in the intimacy of the emotional life 
of people in a very, very powerful way. There's going to be a hurricane today, Mrs. Applebaum. Do you have your D batteries? Hurricane, oi, I lived through the depression. We had nothing barely but the shoes on our feet. And we did it without the help of double D's, D batteries, Mrs. Applebaum. What happens is that you're on stage and it's you and 100 people, 200 people. I know that those 200 hearts that are staring at that one heart of yours just really, they just really want to see an open heart. Human beings, they can feel when you're just acting. And what happens is that you start to lose them. And when you start to lose them, that's pretty challenging because you need to like get them back. Gandhi. Gandhi, 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 Gandhi. Remember when you were 10 and had dance, karate, theater, student government, SAT classes? Who goes to SAT classes at 10? Pike Street is a play about a family in the Lower East Side during a day when a hurricane is coming to New York City. Evelyn is Candace's mother. And about four years ago, when Evelyn was working for the MTA, Candace had um, a brain aneurysm and she was rendered speechless and unable to move. And what we see in Pike Street is a mother who is trying her best to, with the kind of new age techniques, trying to heal her daughter emotionally and physically while also healing her family. No, 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 we're not going to a shelter. Why? Well, we went to the one at Seward Park the last time it was the storm of the century, and all of the generators were old and tapped out. And by the third day, all of the hipsters wanted to charge their cell phones and laptops on the same outlet as my daughter's dialysis, and then we got to deal with all the kids screaming, Mommy, 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 what's the matter with that girl? What's the matter with that girl? Having been from the Lower East Side, where in the 70s and the 80s, it was definitely not known for its chic <laughs> folks as it is now. Um, I always kind of felt in a way that I was living in an invisible community, invisible neighborhood. But one thing I loved about living in the Lower East Side was that um, the neighbors really looked out for one another. And so Pike Street is kind of an honoring of those neighbors, the community, who really not only look out for one another, but can rise when things like Hurricane Sandy happen and, um, and they're forgotten. Mrs. Johnson is a school teacher and she had an affair with one of her students. She has kept this story um, a secret for forever and has not talked to anyone else about this. And you watch this woman come to grips with and at the same time um, lose all of her bearings as the process of the play goes on as she reveals this story. When the man was several yards away, he reached into his memory. No, he had not spoken out loud. And the first person you see on the stage in the encounter is me. I am a creator of the piece. I let the audience in to the process of writing it. The roof above him was shaking. He slipped out of his hammock, stepped out of the hut, and it came down. To his right and left, other huts were coming down. People were standing around in the clearing with their arms full of drinking cords. The second character that you see on the stage is also me. And this is the character of a father. Why should I distinguish between these two things? Because I believe fundamentally that nobody is one single person. The narrator gets to introduce another character, who is this man called Lauren McIntyre. He lay back and tried to think his way into his unconscious. One fifth of the world's fresh water is in the Amazon Basin. One fifth is fresh water. Where does it begin? One fifth is fresh water. Where does it begin? By the end of the 1960s, he was perhaps the principal photographer for the National Geographic in South America, photographing the Amazon basin. And 
They said, we have heard that there are people coming out of the forest who are uncontacted. So he was dropped in and quite quickly, because he knew sort of how to do this, he made contact. <laughs> God, it seems so unlike these people. They never think of the future. They don't hoard, store up belongings. Time for them feels like an invisible companion, something comfortable on the sea, like the air. Yeah, but for us civilizados, time is a possession. It's an increasingly more efficient machine. We live in a moment in which the world is in great distress of one sort or another. We have overused our natural resources. The climate is changing. The planet is heating up. The ice is melting. The seas are rising. The animals are dying. The deserts are becoming ever more arid. People are migrating. And so thinking about these issues has become very urgent to me because I have small children and I'm thinking about the planet uh, that we are leaving behind for them. And what are we trying to do? How are we trying to help them? Or how are we trying to uh, draw attention to the fact that we need to act and react to what's going on around us? It felt like a message, though the headman had not spoken. McIntyre spoke, no Myruna, none of Myruna spoke English, so he looked directly at him. But the headman didn't return his gaze, so he thought, I'll lean closer. Right at the end, I give a message that was given to Lauren McIntyre uh, by the headman. And the phrase is very simple. Some of us are friends. And in this moment of extreme division between us all in the world, perhaps we should all be friends. We should all be communicating and trying to think of what we're doing with this very beautiful world. Bernie Telsey, uh, the casting agent, wrote to me and he said, hey, I know Neil wrote this piece. What do you think? What do you think of solo shows? And I said, well, I think they can be uh, boring. Uh, and vanity productions, unless you have a really great director with a really great concept. And he said, well, we got Lee Silverman. Now, I have always wanted to work with Lee Silverman. And I said, oh my God, I can't believe you're saying this. And because I really, I, I, I was very nervous about doing it. I didn't, I didn't want to take it on. I knew how daunting it would be to learn it. Um, I knew how hard it would be with everything else that I had going on. To, to really be able to give it the time that I wanted to give it. And it really scared me. It really did. I, I just, um, I guess it still scares me in a way. And I suppose in a way that that's, that's good because it's keeping me alive to the process of it. Neil LeBute is an extraordinary writer. I mean, he is so very specific. I mean, there are, there's language that is so tight and taut and so much gives the emotional um, movement forward of the story. And every single moment as I was learning it, I had to fill in a backstory on every single line. That's why it took me so long to learn it, is because if everything is not filled in, you're skipping over things that carry great emotional weight. What Lee Silverman did with me was she had me, as we rehearsed it, she had me go through the entire play. And then she would give me notes. And then we would go back and we would work on the specific notes that she had. And what she kept talking about all the time was that underneath this story is this third rail this emotional third rail that's going on all the time. And you have to have the alacrity and the emotional capability to move from one piece to another uh, within the space of seconds, because that's what's happening to this woman as she is telling this story. She also talked to me about something else that I thought was really extraordinary. She said, you're wearing this other skin, and at certain points, just look for the zipper to sort of 
take that skin off, but you know where the zipper is and everything's going to be fine. And then she said, there are places where what will start to happen is you can't find that zipper. And when you can't find that zipper, things start to escalate and then pieces of you start to fall off of you. And I, I just thought those were such extraordinary directions because they're, they're very, they're emotional directions. They're not just what you think about, it's what you feel. When you are performing and you're directing yourself, it's a great freedom because it means that you can change something if you want to change it. Uh, but also at the same time, it's an enormous challenge because I'm so used to being on the outside and watching that not being able to do that sometimes feels terrifyingly restrictive and I'm not quite sure whether it's any good or not. The first thing I tell a director is I say, okay, there is the solo performer, actor Nalaja, and then there's the writer Nalaja. So if you have questions for the writer, if you could direct it to the writer and say, hey, writer Nalaja, I've got a question, a dramaturgical question. And um, if you have, a, you have notes or questions for the actor, speak to me as an actor because I don't, um, they're not, they're not uh, together. Yes, there is only one body, but when I'm rehearsing, I tr I'm trying not to edit because that writing is not, I feel like that writing is not coming from a genuine place. It's coming from a place of, oh, I've got to change this. Is she gone? Yes, papi, she's gone. Oh my God, esa judia, papi. Is it possible to not start every morning with racism? You think they see me and they say that's a man? No, they say that's a spick. Good morning, I don't want Gandhi to hear your negativity. Good morning, good morning to you. Negativity, ah, psh. If you have characters who are talking to one another, um, maybe a fun thing to do, and this is really just one technique, would be to kind of like snap into them instead of morphing into them. Like for instance, in No Child, I have a character named Jerome and he's, you know, out, he's out a lot. And then I have a character named Shans Rika and she's up in here. And so instead of kind of morphing from Jerome to Shans Rika, maybe there was a kind of snapping from one, kind of like, you know, from Jerome, Chandrika, Chandrika, Jerome. I don't let it bother me. It's just she, she feels the feelings of others and it swallows her. So it's just less stress for everyone if we stay home. Besides, we can't bring her chair down five flights. Tell them the elevator's broke. The elevator's broke. In. Broken. Yes, I'll hold. When I think of solo performance and I'm trying to teach a class, I say, have you ever just come home and told your parents about the wacky thing that happened in school? That's what solo performance is. Or if you think about being at a bar and telling a story to five of your friends at the bar and everyone's listening, that's, that's all that solo performance is. Solo performance is nothing new. This has been happening since the dawn of man and it'll continue to happen.